Yeah. Losing time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Chairman, may I ask for a moment of silence for the late Glenn Eastman, former selectman and a valued member of the community? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Welcome to the June 16, 2014 Selectman's Meeting. Uh, Roman One, we've got a, a fun night to uh, recognize folks that have served this town with distinction. And uh, the first up will be uh, Michael Spolcher, former chair and current selectman. Mr. Griffin. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I hope we can call you to come in sometime. <laughs> 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 I charge you. <laughs> Hey, Mike, come on up here. Let's read that. Yes, uh, Mr. Yeah. Griffin, can you please read that off? <laughs> Thanks. Whereas Michael A. Swotzer has served the people of the town of Hampton with dedication and loyalty as the finance director, the assistant building inspector, and as a member of the Hampton Volunteer Fire Department <laughs> over the course of 40 years, and whereas he has served with distinction, providing guidance and leadership during his tenure as a faithful appointed official, and whereas he has served the town of Hampton beyond the call of duty on many occasions, often at personal sacrifice. Be it resolved that the Sutton and the citizens of the town of Hampton make known their appreciation for service he has rendered to the town of Hampton. Whereunto we have set our hands and seal this 16th day of June in the year of our Lord, 2014 and the 376 year of the founding of the town of Hampton and the 334th year of the founding of the state of New Hampshire and in the 238th year of the independence of the United States of America signed by all the board members thank you again thank, thank you, you so much and Michael and I were on the call for us back in the 70s yeah. together. So. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And we've got three more of these. Uh, and can we please call up the former chair of the board, uh, Mr. Richard Nichols. And Rusty, may, would you please read this? And, and you don't have to uh, read the uh, 234. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Richard. Thank you for your service. But Richard likes figures. <laughs> no, I always felt like I was on the verge of getting tripped up when I got to all those dates. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Resolution and recognition of service. Whereas Richard E. Nichols served the people of Hampton and the town, the people of the town of Hampton, with dedication and loyalty as a member of the board of selectmen for six years, and whereas he served in distinction to provide guidance and leadership during his tenureship, during his tenure as a faithful appointed official, and whereas he served in the town of Hampton beyond the call of duty on many occasions, often at personal sacrifice. Be it resolved that the selectmen and the citizens of the town of Hampton make known their appreciation of the service he has rendered to the town. We have set unto, and then all those dates. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Dick. Again, oh. thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, Dick. Hey, Dick, I was at Demolish yesterday, and you weren't there at 5.30. I what? Weren't at Demolish yesterday at 5.30. Uh, uh, Rusty can verify that I was there about 4 o'clock? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got there early. Is this like the CIA? <laughs> uh, may I please uh, uh, request uh, the former vice chair and current budget committee member, Michael Pierce, and Mr. Woodall, would you please read? Thank you. Good evening, Michael. Thank you, you for your service. Very well, sir. Resolution of recognition of service, whereas Michael E. Pierce has served the people of the town of Hampton with dedication and loyalty as a member of the Board of Selectmen for three years, and whereas he has served with distinction, providing guidance and leadership during his tenure as a faithful appointed official, and whereas he has served the town of Hampton beyond the call of duty on many occasions, often at personal sacrifice. Be it resolved that the selectmen and the citizens of the town of Hampton make known their appreciation for the service he has rendered to the town of Hampton. Whereunto all the dates. <laughs> 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 
Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mike. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, sir. And last, and certainly not least, uh, Michael Pluff, please, please rise. <laughs> Mike's always here when you need him. <laughs> Resolution in recognition of service. Michael T. Pluff has served the people of the town of Hampton with dedication and loyalty as a member of the Board of Selectmen for five years, over the course of 21 years. And he has served with distinction, providing guidance and leadership during his tenure as a faithful appointed official. And he has served the town of Hampton beyond the call of duty on many occasions, often at personal sacrifice. Be it resolved that the selectmen and the citizens of the town of Hampton make known their appreciation for the service he has rendered to the town of Hampton. Whereunto we have set our hands and seal this 16th day of June, in the year of our Lord 2014, in the 376th year of the founding of the town of Hampton, in the 334th year of the founding of the state of New Hampshire, and in the 238th year of the independence of the United States of America. Signed by the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And a heartfelt thanks to, to all four of you. Thank you very, very much, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Roman two public hearing RSA thirty one colon ninety five small b Roman three alpha want to apply for, accept, and expend unanticipated monies in the amount of twenty thousand dollars under the L chip grant program for the purpose of improvements to the exterior of the grist mill. Good evening. Uh, I've asked Mike to come because he's going to be managing this project. We're going for a third try at the LCHIP grant and hope this is a, be a charm for us. So we're asking for your authority to um, have the town manager sign for a $20,000 grant. Uh, we do have our match available. We have about $27,000 left in the, um, in the account to do some work. Um, we'd like to do the foundation, replace the roof, and uh, do some work on the siding. So um, that's basically what we're looking for. Wonderful, Mike. What do you think? Um, also, with doing the foundation, we'd like to start looking at the interior as well. Um, some of the subfloor and some of the charring that happened in the previous fire that happened in there as well. So that's where we're looking to go. And then, I mean, it's, it has some serious cultural significance and integrity, so we'd like to bring one of those charms back to Hampton. That Thank deserves you. to be. Thank you, sir. Mr. Welch? Certainly, um, if the funds are available, Hampton should get them. We need to preserve the historical uh, artifacts of our particular community, and we need to do that with gusto. So I certainly support the, uh, wor the work of the Department of Public Works and the director in trying to uh, do the best we can to preserve our historical uh, buildings and structures. Thank you, sir. Selectman Wolsey. Um, we, now is this the only public hearing that's warranted? Is this the only one we need? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ma After we've heard from the public, I'll be prepared to make a motion. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Selectman Griffin. I think it's great. Thank sure. you. Thank you. I think it, the building needs the work. I mean, I, I sided the back of that about 35 years ago. <laughs> uh, the other uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> not much has been done since then. So, uh, but the building does need it, and it is one of our treasures, and we should go after any funds that we can to get it. So, thank you. I concur. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we will open the uh, public meeting at uh, 19:08. Uh, those wishing to speak, yes, ma'am, please. I appreciate you keep bringing this up, and uh, seeing that very few of you have been inside. Oh, I'm sorry, Candy Stelmack, 488 <laughs> High Street. Everybody. Um, I'd like to invite all of you to come inside the mill and see what you're preserving. Any time at all, or come as a group. We did that a couple of years ago, and we had some of the uh, very well-informed barn surveyors down there to describe what they knew about that kind of structure, and it, it really was a wonderful day. And we could arrange it again if you want to all do it in the same. Day. 
to let us know. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Further comment from the public? Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to make a motion to support this request. Second. Seconded by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor? Unanimous. And a motion to close the public hearing? I will so move at 7 04 p.m. That, that's not right. I would just um, like it's to. It's not the clock. I don't is believe correct. it's right, is it? I it was said early this afternoon, but it's obviously losing time. Well, 1910. Well, whatever people have on this. Okay. I would like to uh, thank Candy Stelmack for all of what she does down there. I've been down there, and uh, it was a beautiful experience to go into the grist mill and really take a look at what's there and what you're saving. And uh, Candy has really done a lot rallying you guys and I'm sure she's helped you absolutely yeah so we owe her a lot of thanks yeah. wonderful thank you sir uh, a motion to uh, close the hearing a second second mr. bridal all those in favor at 11 minutes past the hour thank you thank you very much Do you need for anything else we all set did you We're all set. okay thank you thank you, thank you all thank you, thank you gentlemen Roman three, public hearing RSA 41 <coughs> colon 14 small a, second hearing one, acceptance and acquisition of 5.107 acre parcel, map lot 96, 2 delta dash 11, Great Gate da, Drive. Mr. Welch, please. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, this is pursuant to an original subdivision um, that was done some decades ago uh, for the Subdivision, uh, which became known as Great Gate Drive, uh, was renamed by town meeting. It was originally the old road to Fifield Island. Uh, that road was, um, as a part of that subdivision, uh, this 5.107 acre parcel, uh, which fronts on Woodland Road and Great Gate Drive, was to be deeded to the town. Uh, we've been pursuing this now for about three years, and um, we finally obtained a deed from the property owner, uh, giving it to the town as was requested on the original subdivision. There re requires three public hearings. There are no votes at the first and second hearings, just, just the ability of the public to come and talk. Uh, and then at the third hearing, which will be the 30th of June, there will be a, a motion to either accept or reject the proposal for the deed. Thank you, sir. Questions by the board for Mr. Welch? I have one quick question. Um, given the fact of the uh, 12 shares situation, what will be the stipulations of our acceptance of this? Will we have parameters for this property as to what can be done, what cannot be done on it? Um, are we uh, prepared to make some type of arrangement after we actually own it to, gu to guard the land and preserve it? This would be municipal property if it was accepted. It would not be conservation property, although it is wetland. So the board would have the ability to meet with the Conservation Commission. And if both boards agree, then they could assign this to the Conservation Commission for um, maintenance, watch over, uh, security, uh, to make sure that nothing happens on that particular piece of land. Th Excellent. That would have to be an agreement between the two boards. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Welch? Seeing none, uh, we will open the public hearing at uh, 13 minutes past the hour. Any public comment, please? Seeing no public comment, a motion to close the public hearing? Motion to close the public hearing. I'll second. At the same minute and hour. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Roman 4, public hearing RSA 674 colon 40 small a 1, change conditions of acceptance of Jane Appleton Way. Mr. Welch, please. Mr. Chairman, uh, Jane Appleton Way is a street that was constructed off of um, Exeter Road a number of years ago. Uh, as a part of the acceptance of this roadway, which was built to more than the town standards, uh, the board requested that the developer of the road uh, sign a deed off to the town uh, we're unable to find the developer of the road sir uh, that's that that has been a little bit of a problem so uh, he's no longer in town has moved out of the community and uh, we're unable to locate him we've done a number of uh, searches um, and have not been able to find him so what we would like you to do is we would like you to reaccept the road without that stipulation for the deed the statute does not require a deed we're just hoping to get one at the time, uh, and we'd like to correct the motion so the road can continue to be a public highway. Thank you. 
Uh, questions from Mr. Welch, please. So would you just reiterate, Fred, what what the condition is that we're getting rid of? Uh, the condition was that uh, the developer was to give us a deed for the road. Oh, okay. Since we're unable to locate him. Okay. What's the developer's name? Uh, David, David Barney. David Barney. Right. Oh. He's this no longer a, living in town. He's no longer a registered voter. He's town. he's not on the list. I think he died. I think he died too. That's yeah. He lived yeah. in Exeter. That's yeah, one way. he did. <laughs> and uh, obviously he's we're, been dead for years. We're unable to find him. Oh. This road is 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 is, is, well, is a bit old. Mm -hmm. That's the reason. But the road in itself is in acceptable condition. Actually, it exceeds the um, the requirements of the town by roughly three hundred percent. Excellent. So we did do some board testing of the road, Mr. Bridal. Nothing. Mr. Waddell. Nothing. A time of 7.15, we will open the public hearing. Comments from the public, please. Seeing none. Mr. Welch, uh, a motion. Do you have the verbiage for that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the verbiage would be to accept Jane Appleton Way as a public highway uh, under the statute. I will so move. I'll second. Second by Mr. Waddell. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And a motion to close the public motion hearing. Motion to close the public hearing. Second by Selectman Woolsey. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Roman 5. Public comment period, please. Good. Yes, ma'am. Candy Stelmack with the Hampton Historical Society. We'd like to make an announcement that over the past year, volunteers from the Society have been working on a community interest project. It involved digitizing the seven volumes of Hampton's Old Town Records. They date from 1638 to the 1850s. Previously, some of these preserved records were kept in the safe by the town clerk. Films of them have been at the Lane Library, but their machines have been broken, so even if you were interested, you couldn't read them, and they're very hard to read. Now they've been enhanced, cropped, and made available online for the public to review, download, and print. In addition, the Society has indexed each volume in order to provide a much-needed research aid. It gives a quick overview of the time period. Personally, I think it's a great way for kids to learn their history. You know how they like those short versions of stuff? <laughs> they could read four pages of the index and get a great idea of what happened in certain eras. Um, in addition, we've been using the information that's found in these records, such as the original land grants, the surveyor's returns, in order to map the lots owned by the original proprietors. This project is going to continue to take a few more years to finish, but it's the very first kind of mapping for Hampton, and it'll be of great interest to the founding families and their descendants. But I think this information also is going to be of great interest to Hampton's history and tourism, for placing heritage markers, understanding the unique terms that are used in some of the old deeds, and for rediscovering the history of so many of our disappearing homesteads. Mm. These Hampton Town records are available online at archive.org, but to make this easier, we've provided a link on the Hampton Historical Society's website. It's on the home page tab of Genealogy and Research. And if you are reading the indexes and you want to go to something in that volume, you just click at the top of the page and it'll take you right to that volume online. You can download the whole volume, you can print a certain page or capture a certain mm -hmm. piece that you want. And uh, if anybody has any questions, they can call the Historical Society, 603-929-0781. And we are also looking for more volunteers to do more uh, projects like this. We'd like to digitize a lot more things in, in Hampton. Thank you very much. That's great. Could, Thank you, ma'am. I say something? Yes, sir. Please. I wanted to say that I was in Newburyport the other evening for dinner, and I happened to pick up a, uh, a, a you know, a, a guide of where to go in, I wasn't really sure where it was, but it mentioned a lot of places in Amesbury, and, not Amesbury, but Ipswich, and really that the Newburyport area. But in it there was a little place of things to do in Hampton and the Tuck Museum was the first thing that they listed mm. and I thought that was very impressive that was even mentioned before the beach yes and uh, Candy's <laughs> done a great job as president of the Tuck Museum and thank you very much has the Historical Society thank yes. you I'd just like to thank them for the hundreds of hours they've spent oh, yes. on yeah. this because I know they are, have and uh, 
I know the work they've done, and it's 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 all for the benefit of this town. And uh, I, I, as one member of the board, really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Further comment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Not here as a chairman, just as a resident. I'm Jay Diener from 206 Woodland Road. I've been, um, I'm a race walker and I've been giving clinics in Portsmouth for about the past five years. And um, a friend of mine in Hampton uh, challenged me to do the same thing in town. He said he'd come if I do it, so I'm doing it. Um, so tomorrow evening, Tuesday evening, there will be a race walking clinic at um, the high school on the track. It starts at 530. There's no charge. No pre-registration is required. It's open to anybody and everybody. There are no age requirements. So I welcome everybody to come and see what it's all about and participate. It's a great way to compete. It's a great form of exercise. Um, it's something different. Uh, so if you have any interest, please come over to the high school tomorrow evening, and I'll look forward to seeing you all. A mosquito spray required? <laughs> uh, well, if you walk fast enough, you won't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Further public comment this evening? Seeing none, and thank you very much. Uh, the consent agenda, Selectman Bridal, would you please uh, lead us through that? Consent agenda is, uh, for number one is 2014 ambulance billing rates, no change in rate. Number two is PA 28 inventory of taxable property form for 2015. Number three is the lease for the seawall and Reverse, uh, revetments. revetments and the stairs and town property for number four Northeast Lane. Number four is appointment to the cable TV committee advisory committee. That is Brad Jett and John Justin. Misspelling there. Yeah, it's Judson. 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 That's it. Right. Yeah. J e d s o n. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, number five, the appointment for the Mosquito Control Commission, <coughs> Russ Bernstein. Okay. Number six is the request for permission of outdoor seating and service of alcohol and food. Peps LLC, Brian Provincial and Paul Fields, members DBA Perkins, Pier, Clam, Shake, and Bar, <laughs> number 134 Ashworth Ave, and Brian Provincial and Joe Kelly, DBA Joe's New York Pizza, Brew LLC, 888 Lafayette Road. A one day entertainment license for James House on June 28, 2014. Dance hall permit for Mac Restaurant Group 99A Ocean Boulevard, Hampton Beach, and the Hampton Beach Casino Ballroom, and a license for the coin operated amusement device, Hampton Beach Amusement Company. A motion, please. Motion to accept the consent agenda as Second. presented. Second by Mr. Waddell. All those in favor? I have a quick question on the uh, ambulance billing rates, and I did get the chief's memo. Can we ask the chief for a breakdown oh, every month or so of the, of the uh, buildings that are still outstanding? Basically, how many deadbeats are we checking? Can, well, we, can we just to just point of order? Let's, let's if you can, you put okay. that whole business or put that on. Okay, yes, whole business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the agenda, it's been seconded by Mr. Waddell, moved by Mr. Bridal. All those in favor? Unanimous. And Selectman okay. Wolsey is going to bring up her point. Yep. Under old business or new business, Roman 8, uh, number 1, Donna Bennett, tax collector, A, full-time deputy tax collector. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm here to ask you in public if we could do um, change my deputy position from a part-time position to a full-time position. Um, I've got a, a, a letter here that I kind of went through today, different from the letter you all got, but I think you all got one by email this afternoon. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. If you don't mind, I have to put on my handy-dandy readers here. Um, I'm coming before you tonight to ask you to change the position um, from part-time to full-time. Let me start by saying the deputy position is required by law under RSA 4138. It's a position of great importance because the deputy must step in for me if I become incapacitated. She must be trained exactly as I am trained to fulfill these duties. I believe I am the only office who is required to have a deputy and that position is not a full-time position. I am also the only department head without a full-time employee and I believe I have one of the smallest budgets in the town. Speaking of costs, it's important for me to address the costs associated with this change. Because the deputy currently works 28 and a half hours, it's only a matter of another six and a half hours a week to change the position to full time. If the position is approved as of August 28th and she went on the insurance as of September 1st, um, 
I'm sorry, if, she, if it was approved as of August 28th, the cost of her salary is already covered in my current bu budget. I already have the money in there. Um, there would be other costs associated with it, including insurance re and retirement that don't come out of my budget, but do come out of the town's budget. So I realize that we have to find that money in the default budget. Uh, I believe the uh, insurance would be approximately $7,700 for the end of the year and $1,200 for retirement benefits for the remainder of the year. And after I really closely scrutinized my 2015 budget, it would rise, but it would be less than $4,000. So my portion of that, it's pretty pretty well covered. And I understand that the insurance is, is kind of the, the kicker here. Um, so let me give you just a quick scenario of how important it is to have a trained deputy. If if the tax collector suddenly dies, it's the deputy tax collector that's now given the responsibility to run the office and collect whatever taxes are still outstanding. Um, she has to perform all the duties that I perform that currently, because she's not there all the time, she doesn't know certain things like how to do abatements, what's the difference between an abatement and an abatement refund. And they're big differences because they all affect that government reporting that we do at the end of the year. Um, in the town of Stratum, I don't know if you all remember, about six years ago, the tax collector passed away. She did have a full-time deputy working there. I know her very well. And even though she was there 40 hours a week, she still felt that she didn't have enough training to step into that position. Now, she was able to do it, um, but it was difficult for her at first. And if something happens to me, we kind of have to have the money in the budget to cover her to, be, to work full time anyway. So I, I think it's a good idea if we can get it in the budget yearly. Um, my office only has two employees, me and the deputy. And unfortunately, the deputy position in the past has had a very high turnover rate. So all the training that I do usually ends up starting all over again with a new employee because they tend to move to a full-time position looking for that insurance that they all need. Um, my current deputy has been in the position for four years, so we have a nice long-term employee that we can trust that's been in that office. And um, like I said, she still needs a little bit more training to be able to take over that office if something happens to me. And as you all know, I did donate a kidney last year and had that not gone as well as it did, she might be doing my position today. So, you know, there's things that come up that we don't always plan for. Um, the other benefits for the people of the town is uh, when we have a long-term employee in the office, they recognize our face when they come to the office. They don't have to explain everything to me all over again or everything to Vivian all over again. They see us, we know them by name, and I think that it makes it easier for them because usually when they're here visiting me, it's because of financial difficulties. So when they can come in and we make it easier for them, I believe we actually collect more money because they're, they're coming more often to me and we're explaining to them the more they come, the more partial payments they make, the, the better off they are for saving a little bit at the end anyways. Um, we are given two warrants to collect approximately $50 million a year, or to put it another way, we collect about an average of a million dollars a week. And that's, you know, obviously we put more in the, in the bank when it's tax time like it is now, and a little bit less, you know, on the other. But if you average it out, it's about a million dollars a week. It's very important that the two people in the office are bonded, trustworthy, and honest. And we have been extremely lucky that the people that we have had in that deputy position have been very, very good people. So to wrap it all up here, this is um, pretty much what everyone knows the tax office does. We take payments and apply it to the correct parcel numbers. We deposit checks and cash them in, um, and checks and cash in a timely manner. We keep accurate records for the auditors and we answer questions in the office and on the phone. But there's a lot more that we do that not everyone understands that we do. So I'm just going to go through a really quick list here. Take your time, please. Okay. We work alongside the assessor's office to create two tax warrants a year. We create and send out 19,000 bills of current taxes due per year. Again, we collect an average of about a million dollars a week. 
At tax time, the deputy processes approximately 1,200 payments a day on the, in the computer. We resend about 300 bills that are re returned to us each tax season due to problems with mailing addresses. We process all our checks through a scanner on a daily basis and verify each check that the scanner can't read. And because this is a fairly new system and it works very well, we get the money into the bank about two days earlier than having to bring them to the bank. Um, it's very, very quick. Every year we mail out 750 letters of overdue taxes, 450 letters of impending liens, 70 letters of impending deeding, and about 40 certified letters to mortgagees. We place liens on about 250 properties a year. We take partial payments on all taxes, and those are recorded in the computer system, and handwritten receipts for every partial payment are given to the property owner as they come in. We have 645 property owners that are on our uncollected, uncollected list, totaling over $1.5 million currently. Uh, we create bills for land use change, yield tax, excava excavation taxes, and we manually have to maintain these records. We redeemed paid off liens to the Registry of Deeds within 30 days of pay payoff. We create export files for current and delinquent taxes to mortgage companies for payment of taxes. We process imported files from mortgage companies for payment of $4 million worth of current taxes. Um, in the past, this took over a week to process, and we've got this payment down so we get the money into the bank much quicker. Mm -hmm. We keep accurate records for six years of outstanding liens and taxes. We're working from 2008 to the current year. We balance on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis for all those seven years of taxes. We audit them all on a monthly basis. We send quarterly consensus forms to the U.S. government. We send proof of claim documents to the bankruptcy court for people in bankruptcy. We also have to attend some of those hearings, and they're becoming a little bit more frequent. We attend the court cases when we are subpoenaed. We help process spreadsheets for sewer abatements, and in the past that was uh, calculated by hand. We process abatements in the computer, abatement refunds to the finance department, refunds for overpaid taxes, um, and we contact property owners when we have a, a bounce check. We research tax payments for current years and prior years for people who need to prove that they owned properties in the past. Anything older than 2009 or paper records that are stored in the vault downstairs here. We print tax statements for people who need to get a beach sticker or for, um, you know, the uh, federal taxes. And we've both attended a three-year certification course and both of us graduated with honors. We attend yearly meetings to keep those certifications. We have to do that uh, to maintain those. We work closely with the finance department to assure GL accounts related to taxes are accurate. And we work very closely with the auditors every year. And doing, uh, during tax time, we process about 300 pieces of mail a day. So, and, and the other thing is we are the only tax office that runs a drive through window, which everybody seems to love. <laughs> so I hope, um, I hope this helps you all to understand that we do a lot more than just collect money and deposit money. Um, some specific questions that were asked of me. Annual gross receipts of the tax department for the last calendar year, 2013, was just over $49 million. Total outstanding prior years in number of parcels was 647 Total tax principal outstanding as of June 10th this year was about 1.5 million. Total late payment interest collected in 2013 was just over $318,000 in interest. Um, in the last three calendar years, we have collected over a million dollars in interest. And uh, the total current payroll for part-time employees in my position for 2014 is $32,045. And the proposed change would be 36771 So there is a, a slight difference. But the bottom line of my budget, when I go through each line and I really squeeze them, it's about $3,700. It'll be more uh, next year. So um, I think. I think you might have gotten information from Christy regarding the actual costs of retirement and the, the health insurance. Again, it was pre I was pretty close, about $7,700 for the end of the year. And then, and then she'll be in my budget for next year, and she'll be in the budget for the town next year. So does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat>
That is certainly the most comprehensive description of the tax collector's position that I have ever heard. That is a beautifully done explanation. Um, there, uh, one could say, how can one person be responsible for all that? And that is an absolutely critical, critical position uh, in this town. It all comes back to the money. May I make a suggestion, and then I have uh, uh, another comment. I would strongly suggest, have you got that so that it can be emailed? Because I strongly suggest you get that to Chairman Latimer for the Budget Committee. Mm. Yep. So they can start digesting that sure. uh, before the uh, fall hearings. And uh, I, I will be happy when the discussion is completed to make a motion to accomplish this. But I want to stress for the public, and I have tremendous respect for you and Vivian both. She's done a marvelous job. The position, the authority to create this position, to upgrade the position, is not to be construed as person specific. Right. This is an addition that needs to be made as as an actual position in that department. And we have tremendous respect for both of you, but the tax collector position and a full time assistant or deputy tax collector position to me is the goal of what we're accomplishing here. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, well, obviously, we've discussed this matter in private before. Um, and I think that you do a wonderful job, and I think that Vivian does a, a, a wonderful job. But um, I'm going to be voting against this tonight because I'd rather see the town look at all of the possibilities of what are going to be done this year as a whole. So. I want to again thank you for making the presentation and you do a great job and thank I'm you. sure Vivian does I'm happy <laughs> that she's going to be here thank, thank you. you yes sir no I I, uh, I concur with Louise Mary Louise I think it's a uh, uh, it's a it, it is we're not talking about the person we're talking about a position a position that's greatly needed but on that fact too is I, I was in registering my cars this week and uh, uh, while I was walking by their office, I, I, I overheard a, a person coming in and talking to them. And you could tell just by the expression of this person how relaxed they were and being able to talk to them. And, yeah. and I think that's so important to our, to our citizens that, that they can feel they can have the confidence in you and Vivian when they come in to, uh, at, a, at a time that's really tough for them. And right. I think it uh, says a lot for the people that are in those positions now. So. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I agree 100 percent. Well laid out plan and everything. My only problem is with the benefits, and what are we getting ourselves into when you're increasing that? I mean, I mean, Christie's letter says that you know we might be overdrawn there at the end of the year if we do this, and we're operating on a default budget already. Uh, that that's the question I have, and and I also agree with Rick. Should, should we be looking at all of the positions? I mean, every, every department probably needs employees, and should we be looking at all the positions and going from there? So is it, is it you know, whereas I, I understand the need tremendously, and I, and I agree with it, just, just the fact of the insurance and the benefits. And Fred, are any of these Cadillac uh, insurance, none of those will come under the? Uh, no, this is the changed insurance. Uh, <coughs> Types that the board had voted to implement last okay. year, so, so they're all cut down. Mm -hmm. So we're all, yeah. Can I also say that um, when I talked to Mike and Chrissy about that, they said uh, yes, they're, we're running real close right now on you know on track. They also said that some people might leave, some people mm -hmm. might come in. So so the insurance is one of those things that is constantly changing, and they have no idea whether it would be overdrawn at the end of the year. Yeah, um, you know, I, my problem would, would be that, that if we're going to do this, you know, that, that, that we set up that we're going to look at all the positions in all the departments and make a review of, of what needs to be done and, and do it in, in, a, in a very organized uh, manner. You know, I, I don't know how I'm going to vote on it, but that's my feeling. Okay, thank you. Mr. Welch, would you care to contribute? Uh, well, I understand the... Um, the reluctance of the board, with, particularly with regards to large layouts of money in the following fiscal year. Um, 
do we know what's going to happen with the uh, uh, the benefits in this particular year no we don't we, we periodically during the year we have uh, changes of employees and um, for instance uh, we just had a department head leave and we're probably going to have two months worth of um, benefits that will not be paid out so that'll be a surplus in that particular account we frequently have personnel changes during the course of the year where one person will go out with a family plan, another person will come in with a one-person or two-person plan. That's, that's a sig significant change. Those things happen every single year, and they happen on a regular basis. And we always, we always come in very close, even with hiring new employees, to what the bottom line is. We've been very conservative in how we estimate those costs. Um, what will actually end up being, we really don't know. Um, there is money within the finance department budget to pay for the expenses regardless of what they are um, because we have other lines in there that not necessarily get completely expended uh, for instance we have a line that pays for employees who leave on a permanent basis and they have accrued time and it's last year we uh, we always spent that line that's the first time I believe that I've been here uh, in the tenure, my tenure here that we've actually done that. We've always had usually a substantial amount of money that was left over in that particular line. We don't generally deficit the finance department uh, payroll accounts and, and benefits accounts. Uh, it, it is possible. There's no question about that. Whatever it is has to be. Um, but it's taken on a case-by-case, one-by-one basis. So because that's the way they're allocated, uh, when we make them up, we do them by individual employees and calculate them that way. Um, I know Vivian and, and, and Donna are work very hard downstairs. Um, they're frequently up asking for help and asking questions and seeing if we can't help them with something uh, because just simply because they're overwhelmed most of the time, particularly at this time of the year with taxes coming in. Mm -hmm. um, she's right that this is the only department in town that requires by statute to have a deputy. Uh, the real issue here, and I, I've only been here seven years, but um, we've had a, a, a revolving door down there except for the last four years and uh, I, I know that she's concerned about that I know that she's concerned that um, there are circumstances beyond her control um, she doesn't know whether her employee is going to leave or stay and we never do uh, it just depends upon family circumstances and so forth so uh, she's trying to ensure that we keep the employee and we keep things going the way they are uh, by making it full-time as opposed to being part-time. So I think those are considerations that she's worried about. Uh, her employee is exceptionally well-talented, and she does uh, a tremendous job downstairs. So uh, the decision is a tough one, but I guess sooner or later we have to look at the realities of life and say that uh, you can only go on for just so long with an employee, then they're going to go out and, and try to find something that's a little bit better. Uh, to get to a full-time position. So I think that's basically where we're headed here eventually, and she's trying to short-circuit that. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I would just like to share uh, in these minutes have, I, I don't know if they've been reviewed by the board, but this was, uh, I'll, I'll read it, the draft minutes of June uh, 2nd, 2014 meeting with the Board of Selectmen. It was a full board. Uh, it was with Wanda Robertson, the uh, human resources attorney, and it was with uh, the department head, Donna Bennett. This meeting started out in a public meeting at 6.28 p.m. All board members, all members of the board of Selectman were present. President Selectman Bridal made a motion to go into non-public session, seconded by Selectman Wolsey. All were in favor. Donna Bennett explained that she would like to change her deputy tax collector's position from a part-time to a full-time position. She gave many reasons, some of the you've heard tonight and explain the additional costs in terms of salary and how she could manage it this year within her budget. Attorney Robertson explained the cost to the town of the health insurance and the New Hampshire retirement system. After some discussion among the selectmen, a motion to authorize making the position a full-time position as of 1 September 2014 was made by Selectman Wolsey. It was seconded by Selectman Bridal. Waddell, Bridal, Wolsey, and Bean were in favor. Selectman Griffin was opposed, as he stated tonight. A motion to conclude the meeting was made by Selectman Griffin and seconded by Wolsey. The vote was unanimous to conclude the meeting at 644, and the minutes were not to be sealed, as I am reading them tonight. 
and Donna Bennett will appear before the selectmen as she is tonight at the June 16, 2014 minute. I want to thank you for that uh, celebrity's response to uh, questions from the board, including May, regarding your position. Uh, it is un unbelievably prodigious work effort and an important effort that you conduct in that department. I spoke to a small branch that is uh, uh, dovetailed with a retail operation in town here today. They do $2.2 million in loans. They run a, a, a window, much like you and your <laughs> deputy do. They have four full-time employees, mm -hmm. four full-time employees. Uh, and their work effort, compared to what you do, uh, is uh, infinitesimal. And going on, uh, it, at some point, and uh, it, folks are looking at this recession and, and busting out and how lean it has been, uh, the Standard & Poor is up 50% in the last couple of years, and, and uh, we have been on the, uh, the very small end of the carrot, and we're not getting a lot of nibbles. Uh, your department's very important. Just in the total payment of interest collected in 2013, a return to equity in your department, there's been $318,000 in statutory interest that you have collected. Yes. That's been in your response. Total collected in the last three calendar years, this is just the interest, this is not the tax, is seven figures. It's $1.026 million. So you've gone over the, these issues. Uh, the, the work effort that you perform there is, is incredible. Uh, if an employee is, is in town uh, that's working for us and he gets married and he marries a spouse with three children, uh, there goes your health budget. Um, and that is something that does not increase the work of that employee, it doesn't increase the productivity of that employee, but it increases our benefits. So as the manager has pointed out, these are fluid uh, expenses that we really have minimal control, and this is one that we do. Uh, barring any other f comment, I think Selectman Woolsey is prepared to make a motion. Just a brief comment. You have to look at this as value to the community, and this is one of the most critical operations in the whole town. We need to collect the tax money. We need to collect it efficiently, and we need to collect it uh, with by employing individuals who are um, morally uh, suited to do the job. I am happy to move that we uh, concur with the tax collector's request of creating a full-time deputy tax collector position effective September 1st, 2014. I will second. Seconded by Mr. Bridal. Any further discussion? Seeing I just it. want to say that the reason I'm not voting for it is because I, for exactly what I said, I feel that this hasn't been discussed uh, overall for the whole town, and we haven't looked at all of the departments that I would like to look at. Thank you, sir. All, all those in favor? Coming. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, it, says is, it, is, it is four in favor and one I'm opposed, against. and thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate thank all the comments. You thank, you thank you, thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you guys for all you do. You, you do do a lot. Just keep the you. money coming in. <laughs> Roman eight, number two, Ed Tinker, Chief Assessor, Alpha 2013 abatement approvals. Good evening. Good evening, Ed. Um, I presented two um, abatements of the 2013 abatements. And I also presented a, a spreadsheet for you so you knew where we were at with uh, this year's abatements. But the two I presented were both recommended for refund in the amount of $22,110.98. Um, if you have any questions regarding either one or the spreadsheet, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you, sir. Like I will so move. This there are no denials this time. This is to accept your recommendation on two abatements. Correct. I will so move. Second. <coughs> Discussion. <coughs> Questions. All those in favor. Unanimous. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Roman eight. Number three, Jay Diener, Conservation Commission Chairman, Alpha New Hampshire, Resilient Coast Project. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I'm here actually tonight representing the Seabrook Hampton Estuary Alliance, um, of which I'm a member. Um, the alliance is, um, our, our mission is to protect our coastal and aquatic resources and preserve our estuary through education, community outreach, and research. 
Earlier this year, um, Shea applied for and received an assistance grant from the New Hampshire Coastal Program. Uh, the grant is managed by the UNH Cooperative Extension and New Hampshire Sea Grant and is being carried out by a steering committee of the three towns. Um, there is no cost to any of the towns to participate in this grant. Um, as part of this grant, we are organizing a meeting called Preparing for Climate Change in the Seabrook-Hampton Estuary, and I'm here tonight to give you a little bit of background and to invite you to come to that meeting. Our situation, um, as you well know, is that we're seeing more frequent storm activity along the seacoast, and we're seeing more intense storm activity along the seacoast. So we're seeing a lot more flooding in our communities, and we're dealing with the increased cost of uh, recovering from those storms and floods. Uh, the purpose of this project is to provide the three towns with information and tools to better understand how climate change and sea level rise may impact our towns. The goals of the project are to conduct workshops to facilitate discussions about these issues and to identify priority issues and or actions the towns may want to consider to address the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. How much of an issue is this? Um, more often than not, we speak of this in terms of dollars and cents, so I can do that. Um, in the 52 years from 1950 to 2002, there were 14 declared natural disasters in New Hampshire with storm-related damage of approximately $59 million, and that's in $212. In the 10 years from 2002 to 2012, there were 15 natural disasters with storm-related damage of over $151 million. Yeah. So clearly the weather patterns are changing and the impacts that we're feeling are significant in terms of cost as well as impact to physical structure. Um, in 2011, um, the three towns, Hampton, Hampton Falls, and Seabrook, per, uh, participated in a coastal adaptation work group. And one of the things that we did was we looked at key infrastructure of the three towns and the impact of storm damage on those, on those uh, infrastructures. And in Hampton, we looked at the police station, the fire station, and the pump station, which are our three more most vulnerable uh, facilities. And we looked at the cost of avoidance um, and the cost of uh, replacement. And the ratio between the two was approximately 16 to 1. So, for example, we looked at a cost of replacing these facilities of somewhere in the neighborhood of $80 million um, on one of the facilities. And the cost of protecting it was about $4 million. Um, these are issues that I think we need to explore because clearly they have an impact on the town. And again, it's not just in terms of the facilities themselves. It's a question of yeah. where our money is going to go. And we have to look at if we're going to spend that money, where it's going to come from, and where our money is most well spent. There are a number of other towns in, in New Hampshire that are addressing these issues, um, including Portsmouth, Rye, Dover, Exeter, and Newfields. So it's, it's not just an issue that we have to deal with. Um, it's an issue that all of the coastal communities have to deal with, and a number of them are, are pretty much leading the way in, in dealing with those issues. Portsmouth has developed a coastal resilience initiative. initiative. They did that last year um, to provide an overview of the risks and vulnerabilities um, to public and private assets in Portsmouth. Their report, and, and this report is available online, and I can send you a link if you'd like to yes. take a look at what they're doing. It's going to be used for preliminary and general planning. It's going to cover land use and zoning policy, coastal wetlands, public health, and emergency management. Um, the issues that they have dealt with in that report, the recommendations that they're coming out with, deal with everything from how to protect their salt marshes to what to do about their um, necessary infrastructure, including roads and buildings. Uh, if they have to... Um, make some changes to those to that infrastructure how are they going to plan on doing that is that something that they need to their add to their capital improvement plan and if so on what kind of a schedule can they wisely do that they're looking at zoning changes um, to protect both their public facilities and their private facilities and they're looking as far out as the year 2100 what are the expected sea level rises the expected impacts and what kind of zoning changes would be necessary to afford 
maximum protection to those facilities going that far out. Our salt marsh in Hampton is not only a, a, an important hatchery for a wide variety of aquatic life, um, but it also offers critical storm protection um, for our coastal community. It helps to um, buffer the impacts of storm surges, and, and that's really important to us. I, you may remember that uh, Professor David Burdick of the Jackson Labs Division of UNH was in here some time ago, and he asked for permission to put some testing equipment into the salt marsh, and exactly what he's measuring is how much the salt marsh may be growing or, or receding um, with, with sea level rise. So I think we need to pay close attention to that, and we need to look at what's happening to our salt marsh and what steps we need to protect, take to protect our salt marsh so our salt, salt marsh can protect us. Um, a couple of nights ago, my wife and I finished watching a series of programs on TV about rebuilding some communities in New Jersey after yeah. Superstorm Sandy. Yeah. And there was one town, Mandaloking, where we, there was a particular place in that town where the storm came right through the beach community and established a new water channel going from the ocean to the bay behind it. It wiped out about 30 homes in that channel. One remained standing. And the reason that home remained standing was because 30 years ago when the guy who owned the home built it, he put it up on piers. Um, and the walls on the first floor of that building were walls that were designed to break away in a storm. And that's exactly what happened. His first floor storage room in his garage was destroyed. The rest of his house stood and is still standing and he's in great shape. We have a house in Hampton that is on um, yeah. Ocean Boulevard. Um, it's a little bit south, south of the Northampton border. They also have gone through a number of major storms and had significant damage done. So the last time they re rebuilt their house, they also put it up on piers. So their first floor is wide open except for stairs that go up to the second floor. In the Mother's Day storm, you remember that, mm -hmm. um, their neighbor lost a significant portion of their home. Um, but in this house that's up on piers, the worst thing that happened was that his lawn got flattened by the water that ran across it. So there are some lessons to be learned here, and we have to look at those lessons, and we have to look at how or if we're going to apply them to our community that's going to afford the best results um, as far as where we spend our money, how we spend our money, and how we protect our community, public facilities as well as private facilities, from the impacts of, of sea level rise and storm surges. There's a lot of science out there that says that this is going to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with. There are difference of, differences of opinion about how much the sea is going to rise and how quick it's going to rise. But I don't think there's any question about the fact that it is going to happen, it's just a question of when. So I think that Hampton really needs to start the process of planning for this. We don't have to go out and spend a lot of money now, but we need to maybe establish benchmarks that say if we get to this point, then we have to take these steps. But I don't think, with all due respect to, to the town management, that we've gotten to that point. And so I think this is a process that can get us started down that road. So there is a meeting um, at the Seabrook Public Library on July 17th. Um, it starts at 6. It goes till 8.30. Um, we are inviting all town officials from Hampton, from Seabrook, from Hampton Falls, and we're inviting any, any interested residents um, to come and be a part of this work group and help us to start to build a framework with which we can deal with these issues that are going to be confronting our town in, in the years to come. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, we are going to have flyers that we will try to put on the website, on the town website. We'll have them hanging up in town hall. We'll have them over at the library. If anybody wants more information on this meeting, they're welcome to call the conservation coordinator at 929-5808. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. Selectman Wilson. Yes, Jay, um, are you noticing at these meetings, you said you're um, inviting elected officials. Are you finding planning and zoning board representatives there? Um, Rayanne, our conservation coordinator, oh, will right. be making a similar presentation to our planning board this coming Wednesday. Okay. At the coastal um, uh, adaptation workshop meetings that we had, our planning board was representative, represented as was Seabrook's planning board. Okay. Um, 
So yes, there are town officials who are coming to these meetings. One of the members of our steering group for this this particular committee is the town manager for the town of Seabrook. Because one of the big impediments that I see to all this is that the planning and zoning boards are under tremendous pressure from real from from developers. Absolutely. And much of our marsh is already lost because of overdevelopment. And I think we're still going there, which is a huge concern, not just in the ocean, but along the river. And the uh, marina in Hampton just had to apply to uh, allow it to raise its uh, driveway area and its launching area by three to four inches at least because mm -hmm. they're being uh, overwhelmed by water down there. So we continue to build where we shouldn't build. And I think most of the burden on that falls on the planning and zoning boards. One of the things that um, Portsmouth is looking at is a strict no build policy with a hundred yard buffer all around their salt marsh to protect the marsh. It's tough. It's hard to do these things because you do have people, you have property owners who are not going to like it. You're going to have developers who are not going to like it, but we have to look at what's going to be in the best interests of the town and the current residents of the town in the long term. Do you have any idea as a conservation commission or the, the group of the percentage of marsh that is left in Hampton? Do we have any idea? Because you're right, that does, and that's what wiped out Louisiana when they've been destroying the, uh, the islands uh, at the mouth of the uh, Mississippi River, and sure, there was nothing to protect the them, right. right. So I, I venture to say, if you go back, and, and uh, Candace Stelmach was talking about the old town records, if you go back, we humans have destroyed probably 80% of the marsh. I I, I don't have an answer to your question. I'd, I'd be surprised if it was that extensive. Um, but I don't know the answer. If at some point in time we could get a feel for it, because if, you, if we're going to try stopping development in those areas, and there's a great deal more of the town that's wet than I think people realize. There are a great, great many more. You are familiar with the firm maps that just right. came out, and you and I discussed that briefly but you have actual flooding areas and you have uh, water prone, uh, flooding prone areas over a great deal of this town. We stand sure. to lose a huge amount of money and property. Well, we've got flooding issues that are related to storm activity, not necessarily from the oceans, right. but just the volume of rain that we're getting right. that has no place to go. Yes. Um, so we're getting hit both ways. Yeah, but thank you so much for what you're doing and thank you for the rain garden effort. I was horrified when I saw everything being dug up over there and then now that I'm driving by it, I appreciate, I, f I had forgotten about the rain garden project, but that's, that's great. Very Rel nice job. Thank you. Relative to that, just very quickly, um, one of the folks who helped with designing that rain garden was out there during the heavy rains we had last week to look at the garden and said it performed perfectly. There was no ponding. Um, it contained the water. It did exactly what it's designed to do. So well, it's a well-built rain garden. You wouldn't let it be otherwise. Well, we try not to. Thank you, sir. <coughs> um, when did you say the meeting was? It is uh, July 17th. Um, again, it's at the Seabrook Pug Public Library, and it starts at 6. It goes till 8.30, and refreshments will be served. Yeah. Well, I, again want to thank you because you do a wonderful job and I see how hard you work and how often you come and address uh, all the issues that the planning board needs and you know you've really done a great job as chairman. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say though that you know the, I hear talk here about stopping development. Mm -hmm. I mean I want to point out where I live on Ocean Boulevard opposite Boar's Head uh, how there is a problem with flooding and the flooding is because the sewers don't work right there and they've I have lived there for 50 years and the sewers did work and they need to be replaced or something dealt with and I believe it's a state issue mm -hmm. uh, my property where I live which directly borders the marsh is the oldest house on that side of the street and I um, candy uh, Stelmack did a history of my house. It goes back to the late 1800s, and there are condos all around me. Um, and my, I think, because my house is so old, it I probably was not as low 
that is the, as what is happening there today. But I think before you can even t begin to talk about uh, uh, stopping any kind of development, you have to look at how people that have had properties that have been there for I, in my family alone, for 50 years. And uh, this week when there was a rain, uh, the wood chips that go to the condos to the uh, south of me all have come into my property. That is not the way it ever would have been done in many, many years. I will tell you how uh, I have watched the sea rise, and when you expect it that could possibly come into your property, you're, you know exactly how far it goes. Only one time in 1978 has it even come close to coming to my door, and it did come in. Um, that's the only time. This last year, I would like to report that even though many people think that the sea, the sea has, rose, has risen and risen and risen, it didn't even come up anything to what it's done in the past previous three years. So this year was actually a light uh, year for the, um, the tidal flooding coming in from the marsh. And I know that there's a lot that has to be done, but I don't want to see the property rights of somebody like me or to be, uh, be determined by any board. I have lived there, and I know what to expect, and I don't want to see anyone taking away my rights as a property owner. Neither do I. Thank um, you. I, I know would, you I would be adamantly it. opposed to taking away anybody's property. And um, I've looked and at, I, and I also think it's it's in foolish to suggest that we're going to halt development. But I think we can be smart about the ways we let properties be developed, and I think that's what we need to do. And Jay, you know that we've had discussions, and I've asked your opinion on property that I was considering buying or whatever. And I'm pleased to report that you said to me that you know there's always ways to uh, improve on what is there and there are there are ways to mitigate a better solution and that's how i like to see the uh your board go and you right rayan was with you and um if i was going to buy that piece of property i would really gladly come to you for advice and i'm sure that you would help me i'm sure thank we you. would too thank, thank you. you and you're very fortunate that you live on a property that that has rarely flooded but I not everybody it. is so fortunate yeah. and, and people have had flood well, my issues. property floods every time it rains because the state has done nothing about the sewer that's in front of my house so I know what it's like <laughs> to be flooded and sure. have the water back up but I have complained about it and complained about it and complained about it the state has come down there and done stuff but they still haven't fixed it and the uh, the uh, ways to take water off Ocean Boulevard, it's just, it's gr overgrown with plants. And, you know, all of, Fred is quite aware of my situation. And it's a shame that it's being, that it's, nothing's been done about it. But that's what causes the flooding on my part of Ocean Boulevard, not the ocean or the marsh. So far. So far. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bridal. No, I think he's, uh, I'm, I'm glad we have Jay yeah. in our corner watching watching the areas of town. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, now I live in the high part of town. <laughs> uh, but I lived on Ocean Boulevard for 40 years of my life. And I, like Rick, I know how, how the water can be down there. And I've had our basement washed out a number of times. And uh, so we, we have to start looking at it. So I think that's. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to point out, I used to have a basement. And my building, when it was remodeled 40 years ago, we filled the basement in to avoid something like that. I, I'm on a float, what's called a floating slab, mm -hmm. and I've had 40 years of wonderful life. I love where I live at the beach. Love it. Thank you for your enthusiasm, sir. <laughs> and you know it. You've insured, you've insured me all 40 years. Amen. Amen. Mr. Waddell. Jay, thank you. And being proactive, I think, is the important thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, as we all know, and, and without going into the reason or not, I mean, the sea rises and the sea goes down. I think 4,000 years ago, we could walk out to the Isles of Shoals. I think the, you know, was there. So, I mean, that, that happens. And I think the most important thing is, like you say, to be proactive so you save money <coughs> in the future. And, and I don't know if you've ever read anything by uh, uh, the skeptical environmentalist Bjorn Borg, the uh, Copenhagen Consensus. He writes an awful lot of good stuff about how we can, you know, without 
getting into property rights, people's property rights, or, or halting development, do it intelligent development, and a lot of it building houses on piers and stuff so that if it does flood, it doesn't bother us. Sure. So, you know, thanks for being proactive and, and yeah, and don't don't step on Rick's rights. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're absolutely right that, that the weather is cyclical. Yes. But we tend to look at short-term short -term cycles, and we tend to say, well, it wasn't all that cold this winter, so what's with global warming? I don't understand it. Well, you can't do that. You have to look at the long-term cycles because that's really where you see which, mm -hmm. which way things are headed. Yeah. Um, so long-term, the seas have gradually been increasing in height, and there's no science that I've seen that says that process is not going to continue for the foreseeable future. Eventually, it's going to reverse itself, but who knows when and who knows how far underwater we'll be at that point. Right. So in the meantime, we have to prepare for what's in front of us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I hope to um, see you all on the 17th. Thank you. Thank you. Roman 8, number 4, John Chagnon Ambit Engineering, Alpha 52 to 54, Glade Path Seawall, Glade Path Condominium, care of Barbara. Jean Grandy. Jean Grandy. Thank you, young lady. And, and I'll have Mr. Welch just do an intro, please, sir. Mr. Chairman, this uh, uh, is about uh, a repair <coughs> to the back of their property, part of that property uh, that they're going to build a uh, revetment or a seawall on. Uh, is actually on town property. We own the marsh directly behind them. And uh, I believe their engineer is going to explain exactly what he's going to do uh, so that we can have a good idea what's going on and, and you folks can vote to go ahead and get that done and uh, we can process the paperwork and get through this. Thank you. John. Uh, uh, Mark Batchelder from Ambit Engineering. Summing in for John. Uh, pretty much what we're proposing to do, uh, did if I yeah. point that yeah. over here. Yeah. Um, this is the, the, uh, the property, um, and right along here, this is the side of, with the marsh, and right along here is the, uh, the property line. So a portion, of, a portion of the existing sloped wall is, is on uh, Ms. Jim Grande's uh, property, and a, and a small portion is also town property. And what we're proposing to do is take, right now it's, there's no stone there whatsoever. It just keeps washing out. It's all mm -hmm. just sand and uh, and whatnot. And the next door neighbor has already uh, put in a riprap uh, revetment wall. So what we're proposing to do is uh, go in there with some uh, light to medium equipment where uh, the contractor is going to be sizing the equipment appropriately, not to bring in uh, too large of equipment, and excavate out um, the existing uh, uh, soils in order to create a, a nice solid base and and then bring in some uh, some large riprap stone um, I think we're planning on going down about about two feet just to get that that base going because if uh, if you don't if you don't do that then you still get the chance with these uh, hundred year storms of it just washing out so uh, the intent is to build something that's going to last um, and something that'll that'll also save save the frontage that uh, that's there. There is uh, currently some existing dead trees and vegetation there, so those will be removed and new vegetation uh, proposed the, uh, to be placed there. The uh, contractor um, will be accessing the the uh, construction area via the driveway. Uh, so all equipment and everything will stay within the property and then uh, the only time that it will encroach on the, the town's property is when the actual uh, excavation work is, is going to be happening. Every day the, uh, the equipment will be brought out and parked back on the property out of the, the marsh area. Uh, obvious things are they're going to be putting down uh, uh, erosion control measures prior to the construction starting. Uh, the contractor believes the equipment that he's proposing to use uh, the soils are suitable for it if for some reason uh, the, the soils are not uh, swamp mats will be used to, to help stabilize and add the extra support um, and then pretty much as sequencing goes the intent is to start uh, as far away from the driveway as possible excavating coming back putting down uh, geotextile fabric and then the stone following in its footprints um, Staying within the uh, the 
yeah, the footprint of the stone wall. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. It's a very small portion. I mean, there's it, it, it varies. I think it two two feet or so is on uh, the town property on this side, and by there it's probably four feet, five feet. So it's it's a it's a small portion that'll that's on the town property. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, is there is the water there fast moving, or because no. it looks like it's not so much um, with the effect you'd have at the ocean, but it's eroding the bank basically. It's pulling. Have you had a survey to see how much of you, the property has been eaten away? You see the pictures at uh, Plum Island or at the Cape and stuff where the banks are all coming down. Have can have you been able to tell whether you've had significant enough erosion so that the the lot is diminished we've noticed it right but i don't know whether they took did that when they did the survey no no this uh like because you've you've owned the, this is the our property fifth for, summer for yes. four or five years have yeah. you seen any anything that five years like estimate how much maybe a frontage that you feel like it's probably nine inches to a foot i'm thinking of a particular oh, rose bush okay. You know. So it's still relatively small, but we want to prevent it. Exactly. Yeah, and I like the idea of the mesh. Um, now you're going to be, you said riprap and loose stones. I know what happens by the ocean when the waves come in and take those stones and throw them all over the place. Is this going to be literally loose stones, or are they going to be some kind of blocks? The, the the next door neighbor has stones that are approximately this size they're about six inch mm -hmm. uh, what we're proposing is larger stone at this point they don't actually uh, go by uh, a, a, an inch size they actually are Correct. classified by weight, weight. and these are mm -hmm. going to be you know 50 to 100 pound mm -hmm. you know 200 pound stones so they're going to be of large size so that e even though we you don't uh, this particular property doesn't get the same wave crashing right. as as the ocean. It's still meant to to diminish any type of any any t uh, potential for Laughing. that, and and obviously be long lasting. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Thank you for doing that. It's it's good to see. And in light of what J. Diener just said, it's nice to see properties starting to be protected that are adjacent to the water. I know I'm not looking forward to the day where we have to put it up on stilts. But <laughs> <laughs> Selectman Griffin. No, thank you. Selectman Brown. No, I think it's a good project. Fine. Mr. Welch, a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would propose that the board uh, authorize um, the erection of a, a seawall revetment for 52 to 54 Glade Path uh, in Hampton, subject to uh, completion of all paperwork and fees. Thank you. I will so move uh, the permit is included. Yes. In that. Yes, and the it insurance is. Uh, Everything stipulations. Yes, the two okay. documents. I'm happy to move. Second. Uh, Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Good. Roman 8, number 4. Ambit Engineering, Bravo, 1034 Ocean Boulevard, Seawall, John and Jerry Cerullo. Again, Mark Batchelor with Ambit Engineering. Uh, this is a similar uh, situation uh, that I just spoke about. However, this is actually on the beach with mm -hmm. more yeah. wave uh, uh, action and and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is the existing this is the existing property here. Um, I believe the abutting property has already gotten the approval okay. uh, yeah. to yeah. reconstruct their revetment wall, mm -hmm. and it's going to. The proposed uh, the contractor is the same contractor, uh, so pretty much his plan is exactly the same as it as it was for the abutter. And uh, essentially, what this is is reconstruction of this uh, stone revetment wall that's obviously starting to really you're you're losing frontage of the beach. It's just sloughing out by ten feet or so, and. Um, the proposed work on this is actually to use much larger stone. Uh, the base material will be 
uh, on the order of one to one to three ton uh, stone, yeah. and the um, surface will be on the upwards of four to seven ton stone, and those will be um, in some 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 situations will be anchored into one another either with Good. rebar and epoxy uh, just to help strengthen that up and the again the intent is to construct a uh, long-lasting um, uh, durable product that'll obviously um, uh, protect the, the the property and also the, the beach as well and in this this situation the contractor has no access from uh, the property. So what he is proposing, I believe in the uh, submission documents, uh, is a blown up shot of the entire beach, accessing it through a uh, access further down and coming up. Now this is also <laughs> a more populated location than the previous one. Yep. Uh, so certain uh, uh, requirements are going to be needed for fencing, keeping people out of it, you know, uh, out of the way and, and working during whatever specific hours um, are required. So <coughs> with that. Thank you, sir. Questions? Yes. Uh, now, is the construction going to be concurrent since this is an abutting property? Is the contractor going to be in there doing them both basically at the same time? That's the plan. Yes. That, and I can't see the plan too well from here, but what's that circle? Um, it, it looks like a circular, yeah, what is that? That there is the uh, the focus area of the reshaping. This, oh, okay. This is the area we're sloughing the most. Oh, okay. So the, the grades are gonna change the most in this area to be what it <coughs> okay. used to be and should be. And access to the beach, uh, stairs, what configuration? Uh, currently, right now, there's a set of staircases, uh, a set of staircase uh, at this location here, and that's uh, proposed to remain. Uh, a stone as, staircase? No, I believe it's a wooden staircase that you that during the winter you take out, right? Oh, okay. No. No. Actually, the bottom of the staircase is a ramp that's removed, yeah. and then the stairs are permanent. So wooden stairs, two sections. Okay. Yeah. They actually. Um, they just replaced them last year with, it's it's a wooden frame, but it's the material that the deck is made out composite of. Composite deck. deck. Yeah, right. Composite yeah. wood, yeah. So it'll, it'll yeah. be much more. But yeah. there's no change to the steps, right? No. no. I'm just thinking of safety, you know, accessing the beach and so forth, or if people try running up there so they don't get hurt. Yeah. Right. The, the steps were built in uh, 1995. Okay. As a, a cement base and a wooden over the Okay, over good. The and it's permanent. Good. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, ma'am. Second book. No? Thank you. And, and just to be clear, this work will be done concurrent with the next door neighbors. That's so it'll be done the mm -hmm. in the fall, not now. Right. All right. Yeah. So. Good. Hi. Mr. Welch, please. A motion. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that the board vote to authorize the erection of the seawall of revetment and wind staircase at 1034 Ocean Boulevard. Construction not to begin until after September 15, 2014, and after all uh, required permits and, and uh, documents are completed and signed, approved by the board. I'll so move. A second, please. Second. second. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous? Yes. Yeah. It's going to be a big help. Thank you. Nice Thank you. Good luck. Hope it goes well for you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, sir. Did we skip over announcements and community calendar? I think we, we did. did. We did. We did. <laughs> Skip's giving me the evil eye because oh, he was here to have uh, <laughs> an announcement. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> but he loves being here. Oh, Skip, we'll get you at the end of the meeting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'd like to go to our community announcements right now, please, sir. Okay, I, I got it. I'd okay, and my apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the James House Association is going to celebrate its 20th birthday with what? a full year of celebration, starting with opening day at the James House, June 28, 2014, at 186 Toll Farm Road in Hampton. The public is invited to all 
uh, or any of the day's events. At 1130, there will be a tour of the James House and its property. 17, 1723 house with a 1705 L and a 1702 farmstead on the National Historical List of Historic Places. 1 p.m., a potluck lunch free to all the visitors, so there is a free lunch. Uh, 1 p.m., during lunch, Avery Hill will sing some of her most popular uh, folk songs. 2 p.m., featured presentation, Choosing the Right Plants for Your Landscape by Lise, Lise McNaughty, uh, owner and landscape specialist for the Landscapers Depot in Kingston, New Hampshire. And after that, there will be the annual meeting, which the public is invited to any meeting. So the public is invited to any or all of these events. It's a great event. It's a great place. It's a great association. Please support it. Thank, Thank you. you. Skip my apologies. You're not going to. You're not going to let us know what's in the potluck part. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, but I do know the quantity. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, any further community announcements? The only thing I have is the uh, Smutty Nose is having their 5K road race this, uh, is this Sunday, uh, 9.30 to 10.30 out on Toll Farm Road. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, it would be nice if, if people are out in that area and they, they see some runners. Just be patient. It's only going to last about an hour. Mm -hmm. So Wonderful. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none. Roman 9, approval of minutes, June 2nd, 2014, non-public. I will so move that we adopt those publicly, Mr. Chairman. You have already read them relating to the deputy t uh, tax collector position. Second? Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And I will so move the minutes of June 2nd, 2014. A second? By Mr. Waddell, and any changes, corrections, amplifications, modifications? Seeing none, all those in favor? Yeah. Unanimous. Thank you. Roman 10, Town Manager's Report. Mr. Welsh, please, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the Board, the uh, Seafood Festival will be held September 5, 6, and 7, 2014. Important for vendors, this, the sidewalk vendor license is on the town's website under Document Central Forms and Licenses. The deadline to submit to the town manager's office for license approvals is August 25th. That's so you'll coincide and have them available so when this starts the following week, you'll be all set. Uh, the town has a number of vacancies in appointed committees and commissions. Please contact the selectman's office if you're interested in serving in any of the following. The two two-year terms are one, uh, one year, one three-year term on the Energy Committee. One three-year term or one four-year term or one five-year term on the Lease Land Commission. Mm -hmm. One one-year term on the Recycling Education Committee. One three-year term on the Rockingham Metropolitan Planning Organization Technical <laughs> Advisory Committee. You can say that three times fast. You'll probably get an appointment really quick. Uh, Permit procedures for planned activities within the boundaries of the town of Hampton. We've had a number of instances in the last few weeks where um, we have found out at the very last minute, and the board has had to respond at the very last minute, in some awkward situations of granting permits for individuals uh, that are going to hold activities, large activities by and large, uh, that need either permits of assembly or they need special things with the police department or, or special permits from the town for one reason or another. If you're going to hold an activity, please call the selectman's office. Let us know. We'll tell you whether you need a permit for anything, mm -hmm. just so everything goes fine for you and we can get everything in a good order and get them done for you. But that is important. Um, the State Department of Resources and Economic Development has updated their activities list requiring a state special permit. So this is something, too, if you're... <laughs> If you're doing something on state property, you do need a special permit from them. In some cases, you also need a special permit from the town. There are 14 activities remaining on their list through October 5, so they have a number of different projects going on. The Selectman and Planning Board are advised to keep an eye on House Bill 1210. That places extensive new requirements on the town for any proposed zoning changes. The bill has not been signed yet by the governor, but probably will be soon since the requirements were added to a bill legalizing the school district bonding vote in, um, hmm. I believe it was Hanover. Oh. So the governor is probably going to sign that so the, the school department can build a new building. Uh, and it was attached by the, a member of the House at the last, last few days of the session. Hmm. 
It does require, though, that the town spend, send extensive notices uh, to mm -hmm. everyone within a zoning district when certain things change. So this could yet to be a very cumbersome process. Um, and there are two different requirements, so there are two different notices required. Uh, status on the update for the withdrawal from the Southeast Regional Solid Waste District. Uh, we had a meeting last week. Uh, the, the district voted to authorize the towns of Hampton and Southampton to withdraw from the district. Uh, that vote sets up a formal procedure that must be followed in order to carry that out. I think everybody's probably aware that town meeting voted to uh, authorize the town to submit that request for withdrawal to the solid waste district a year ago. Uh, that's in, been in process. Uh, it has been voted by the district. Uh, the district uh, council will now, uh, their attorney will now set up a, a, a letter to the town indicating the process of withdrawal and any costs and expenses that the town must bear from the, that withdrawal. That'll come to the selectmen. It sets up a scenario where that goes into a town meeting. If there's any cost, usually it's the council's cost to get that done, uh, then we'd have to pay that as part of the withdrawal. Uh, I can tell you that from looking at the financial statements of the district, they, all, they have something in the order of $80,000 that's being held. About 45% of that is <coughs> ours. So I'm anticipating a large refund of the town does vote to withdraw, uh, which, which would be very pleasant for a change. Uh, a couple of other things. Um, I sent a communication today to the governor of the state uh, regarding <laughs> regarding the dangerous conditions on the North Beach on Route 1A. As you all know, we had two young ladies who were struck by a motor vehicle up there. Mm -hmm. There's construction going on up around 13th Street for the seawall. Mm -hmm. uh, that construction forces people to cross to the other side of the street to the westbound side. Um, of Ocean Boulevard and then walk in what I would term as the breakdown lane because there's no sidewalk in that area. In the past, uh, DREAD and, and uh, DOT have fenced off the east side and put a Jersey barrier for so people can walk between the barrier and the, and the fence which separates the construction. Mm -hmm. That has not been done in this particular case. And I've asked, I sent an urgent uh, appeal to the governor today to uh, instruct DREAD and DOT to immediately erect that barrier so that people can be safe from walking up there and citing the example of the, the two ladies that were unfortunately struck on that particular road. Mm -hmm. We'll wait for a response from the governor's office, but I suspect it will be swift and, and um, they will be um, asked, hopefully, to put that up there as quickly as possible. So, um, and Mr. Chairman, that's it. Thank you. Questions for the town manager, Selectman Wilson. Takes it's too bad to, to take a, have a situation like that occur before you can get that resolved. I have a few. Um, first of all, I still do not have a list of the state contacts for the dread the beach for summer. Have we been provided with one yet? We have not. We've requested it three times and still have not been provided with one. Is it possible to communicate? to the powers that be that the members of this board are a little annoyed at this point in time? They were told that before we asked the first time <laughs> because we asked the previous year as well and we never got the contact list. Well, then they can forget our contact numbers if they have a problem. Oh, don't worry, they know them by heart. <laughs> Rusty, you know, and you were talking about getting together in a gentle, mentally congenial fashion and whatever. Well, um, hmm. uh, I would like to ask if we could uh, uh, ask the manager's help in maybe drafting a letter of uh, just of concern and, and sympathy to the families of uh, Lisa Beaudry and, and Karen Weinhold. Yes. I think it would be nice for us as a board to to send some uh, little uh, encouragement and, and concern uh, to their families because that was a terrible thing that happened. Um, the gentleman who was just here from AMBIT talking about the uh, revetments at the beach, I have had a lot of complaints about the conditions at Place Cove and Fred and I were discussing this briefly about having safer access, especially at this time of year 
the water is still bringing in large quantities of stones. It's difficult getting down there. We were talking about uh, what the lady uh, for uh, 1054 was just describing about possibly a, um, a removable uh, ramp and stairway with railings so people can get down there safely. Uh, there are a lot of residents who use that beach area and it seems sad to deprive them of it and I'm almost wondering whether that beach is not in future years are going to be accessible for the residents because of the the wave action and the stones so if we may ask Fred to put that on a future agenda so we could have a little thought I think one of the things we're looking at at this point is is the far end of that beach um, the north end uh, which doesn't seem to be piling stone up and building a walkway down over that end. Mm. But we, we are battling the stone. There's no question about it. It's coming in just as fast as we can remove it. The small stone, is that what? It's small. It's, it's, it's from the break-off ledge that's probably 100 or so yards out there yeah. in the ocean. Uh, we get heavy wave action because of all the storms we've had. Right. It's, a, it's a piece of uh, just crappy ledge. Mm -hmm. and stone ledge and, and uh, we get a heavy storm it just mm -hmm. throws that material up and just puts it in there on the beach and it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a real nuisance to have to move. We're either going to, and it's unsafe, we're either going to have to post that beach as inaccessible at some point in time or try to find a way in the meantime, probably eventually they, we won't be able to use it. But um, you were also mentioning about permit procedures for the planned activities. Uh, one little twist that I would like to add here is that I know because they want to conduct a lot of these activities at the beach that they tend to head for the precinct commissioners. If the precinct commissioners would be kind enough to say make sure you go to the Board of Selectmen, I think that would help uh, just just as a courtesy and kind of pushing them along up the chain. Um, memory, the joint operation plan. I got your letter, Fred, I know all of us did. Um, to us June 11th of uh, the town received the proposal we prepared and sent and their proposal changed a number of items and so forth I am NOT going I don't care what they come back with I know you've worked hard on this this board is responsible for this stuff this board is responsible for signing this joint operation plan I'm not going to touch the confounded thing unless someone with dread will communicate with this board like civilized individuals, as Mr. Bridal was pointing out a couple of weeks ago. Would it kill them, those who are employed by the state of New Hampshire and paid by the taxpayers, to drive to Hampton one night in a year and come here and sit down with us? I think it's outrageous. What they're doing is negotiating with the manager, but it's our responsibility. It's taking up Fred's time. I think it's outrageous, and I'm just going to state that to you, that I don't give up one banana what comes in front of us. I am not going to sign it. I'm not going to pay any attention to it, unless and until they will get their hind ends down here from Concord. Next, um, the town and city. The SRF funding. No, now, the deal with the SRF funding has been that we construct projects like sewer, wastewater treatment plant, etc., and get reimbursed 20% from the state. If you look on page 26 in your town and city, it's showing the municipalities, landfill closures, grant awards, first payment. Hampton is owed $840,000, and we're going to get a payment of $50,609 in this year. There are a couple of years when they haven't given us anything. More than a couple. All right. Then the next line, Hampton, again, $1,256,633 in one column, and the first payment's going to be $83,907. Taxpayers have paid for these projects. We've been promised SRF com compensation. The taxpayers who have paid for these things are going to be dead and gone or moved by the time some of this comes back into the tax base. I am exasperated. I really am. And uh, Phil is rubbing off on me, I guess, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> this is outrageous. And we're not the only community. But somebody up there has got to get their hind end in gear and start dealing with some of this stuff. What are we? What are we, the little guys at the bottom of the 
the staircase? Probably. But I think that's insulting. I think it's outrageous. And I thought I would mention it because I'm really cross. Next one, health trust. Um, have we, they, they sent those smarmy letters. Are we going to in the near future, well, I'm tired of, of of listening to them, that they've managed to recover the $17 million. When are they going to dole it out to us? When are we going to get our share? And are we going to get it in a lump? Do you know? Don't know. Don't know. <coughs> I know we're going to get it, but I can't tell you if it's going to be in a lump. And this is money, and you know, <coughs> for the employees and the retirees and the taxpayers, that this stuff is still hanging out there. Oh, now, in light of this, can we expect, or may, can we contact Bill Gardner's office and ask if the Bureau of Securities Regulation is going to be empowered to conduct an annual audit on these guys? Because I don't want to see in the future, they, they had not been returning the surplus, what they were supposed to do, as a nonprofit, and they're not doing it. I want to see an annual audit by the Bureau of Securities Regulation if they have that within their power and, and Bill and the securities guys will know. So we know what the money situation is and are they now on the level path where they are indeed refunding to Hampton and the other towns the, the money that they've been squirreling. They're supposed to turn back the, surface, the, the surplus. Can we appeal to Bill Gardner's office and at least ask that? We can. Uh, I can tell you that, <coughs> excuse me, the 17.1 million, they have sent a letter out saying they're going to refund that. They haven't said when, but they are going to refund it. Yeah, well, I read that. To all that. the cities and towns. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that for this past year, they've already refunded to us. And that's that's been distributed. A little okay. bit. Yeah. It's not much. But we're talking about, and gentlemen, and, this is from 2010 on, 2009, 2010. Yeah. Now we've got those years from 2003. And I asked the BS, I, I asked Adrian, I think it was, when, when, gee, a couple of years ago, when Eileen Latimer and I went up to the uh, thing in Dover that Bill Gardner held. And I said, what's going to happen to the money that they weren't handling properly before the legislature stepped in with penalties? And he said he thought if they were successful in cleaning up the recent years that they might have the legal standing to go back and try to recover from the prior years. Those years have not been compensated at all. You know that as well as anybody. I don't think you'll see those prior years. Probably not, but it's, it's a dreadful situation and I hope we have a lot better oversight going forward. Um, Sandbin Road, Road drainage, I understand there may be a plan um, planned development in the near vicinity and there is apparently a a problem uh, on Sandman Road right now with drainage would you be kind enough to ask Keith or Chris yeah. if they would go and and talk um, uh, 24 Sandman and that area if they would take a look we don't want uh, another development built adjacent to make the problem worse so I'd like to get a handle on what the problem is there now uh, and then uh, proceed and I don't know who's going to build what but I don't want more problems and I I ran down you'll be happy to hear that's the end of my list under 10 minutes very well done thank you appreciate it selectman Griffin yeah. he's timing me now <laughs> I would like to just point out that you know what happens with the rocks at the beach and that changes every year as a yeah. person that has to live there and walk the beach for 50 years what happens one year doesn't necessarily happen the next the sand gets deposited and rusty you know this they have to go out there and move everything around so it's different from one year to the next in case anyone isn't aware of that I'd also like uh, to thank mrs. Wolseley for some of her opinions uh, but, and I agree with some of them, but I would just like to remind anyone that's listening out there that she speaks for herself and not necessarily for the board. Thank you. Selectman Bridal. Well, I, uh, I was uh, up on Route 1 this w past week, and I noticed they were putting some new signs out for the crosswalks, and I think that's, they look mm -hmm. great. Um, and, I, and I also talked with Keith, and I guess they're going to be painting the sidewalks this week. Yes. The crosswalks. Yeah. Can we can we have a crosswalk installed 
in the area of 401 Lafayette Road. Yeah, you Road. mentioned that. If, if uh, the board orders it, yes. Good. Right. It doesn't meet the traffic warrants of the, uh, but uh, if the board orders it, it can be installed. I'll make a motion that we, we have a crosswalk installed in the area of 401. And the reason we're doing that is um, the businesses up in that area are, are cooperating with each other on parking. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're using parking lots across the street and moving back and forth. And the closest one southbound is about 350 feet, and northbound is the one yeah. in the center of town about 300, 350 right. feet. Yeah. Too far so apart. They're too far apart, and I think it, it warrants that area. So I'll make that motion that we have a crosswalk. I'll second, Rusty. All those in favor? Unanimous. Yeah, okay. good. Other than that, everything's good. Thanks for noticing. Uh, well done, sir. Yeah, I'd like to, Fred, piggyback off of what uh, Mary Louise was saying about the state, you know, and about getting the JOP and all that done. But I, I really think we should be utilizing our state representatives and our state senator. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they sit on committees that, that, that yeah. dread has to go to. And I, I really think we should get them in here and talk Good. with them and say, you know, li listen, we, we got to get this going and we got to get this work and we got to get it, you know, and I agree with Rusty, we'll do it more than you, Mary Louise, we'll do it in a gentlemanly fashion, we can get that done. But being cross is good too. I know gentleman. you're not. <laughs> uh, so I think I think that's good. And and when we talk about uh, permits for events in towns and stuff, I think at some point we really got to stop and take a look at exactly how many events we want and, and you know yes. have, have a plan for that, yeah. so that yeah. we're not running into the position where a circus comes in and everybody's oh, where the heck did the circus come yeah. from? So I mean, I mean, if we had an overall plan and people knew what they were looking at, I think we'd be much smarter and much Good. better off. Uh, so that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Welch. Thank you on uh, Roman Ten and your your uh, manager's report. The permit procedures for planned activities, and if we can uh, develop that with the mm -hmm. department heads, if we can yeah. reach out to the Hampton Beach Area Commission, the uh, the precinct, and so uh, we we had a right to know seminar here. But if it could just be uh, an email from you to those. Uh, sister commissions and boards that, that do so much good work and sometimes uh, through uh, benevolent intentions the staff procedures uh, run amok and then we have problems and if we could additionally do so and, and not leave the stone unturned with the state and, and foster that relationship where if they know something's brewing down at the state park if they know that something's going on that you are notified so you can notify the board I think that we need to be just a little bit more aggressive as, as you can see the state is now giving us a list of activities that are going to go on on state property yes, today we asked uh, for a copy of the the actual filings so we actually know what's going on just not the name of the activity and we also asked them to give us a copy of every activity um, program uh, request that they receive as it's completed and approved. Wonderful. So. Thank you, sir. And, and, and along that, that, that vein, I, I think that the Zoning Board of Adjustment, I think your department had stepped up in uh, scintillating uh, in a very effective way last week to address what is going to transpire at the State Park. And uh, everybody came out a winner on that. And that is notwithstanding the, the last minute 11th hour Hail Mary that your good department folks have to uh, dedicate to something like that and it just becomes cost prohibitive in amounts of time. So yeah. if we can continue to work that and please thank your department heads. Roman 11, old business, Mary Louise Wilsley, please. Oh my goodness. You know, I will make a generic comment that the reason we're sitting here, I think, is to throw out ideas and actually to be identified by what we are uh, looking mm -hmm. at and what we are fostering and, and uh, advocating for. Um, I have mentioned before, and I will mention it again at the pleasure of the chair, I would like to see us sometime before Labor Day get together as a board and set up an appointment Saturday morning at 10 a.m. roughly to go over to Public Works and take a serious look at the rolling stock. I mean, look at those pieces of equipment. Look at the configuration of the land. I want to talk to you about an area that has potential to put the pole barns to shelter that. I want you to see all that equipment that is sitting out there exposed to the elements and the condition of some of those vehicles. And then hopefully when we start talking about the CIP program, which I'm going to address next, we will have a mental picture. We have got to pare down and fine-tune the rolling stock in the Public Works Department. 
So I will leave that to the good offices of the chairman if he'd be kind enough to set something up for us. I think we all need to go there all together and look at all. And Mike Ingress will hopefully be on, on scene. Um, I mentioned this earlier in conjunction with the uh, fire chief's recommendation that we don't increase the ambulance fees this year. Is there a way to get from, from the vendor uh, who handles the actual billing from us the number of defaults or however you want to put it? I, I said deadbeats earlier. Maybe that's not too polite, but nevertheless, uh, we are being shorted out on revenue for the uh, ambulance service, and that was one of the reasons we set that up so that it would be self-funding. Uh, and I, I just wonder if we can ask for some type of, of a report at intervals on where we are number, not necessarily, well, the dollar amount too probably, but the number of runs that are being made and not compensated. I, I hope that's a fair way to put it. Um, I have two more under the CI, uh, I want to talk about the CIP meeting under new business, and I have one other. Now, I did that in under 10 minutes. Are you continuing? Uh, under new business. Okay, under new business. nobody else has any old business. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, I have old business. Old business. I just want to um, give you an idea, although I'm not speaking for the state, but I, I think Fred knows about the answer to this more than I do. The reason why the state doesn't come is uh, they their policy is what is it about not appearing they don't have a they have to go back they can't make any agreements here with this board without checking in with the, with their superiors and where we have a the ability to uh, you know make a motion and do whatever we can do that but they don't have the ability to do that and that's one of their concerns and it's a concern they have voiced over and over again so it's not like it's something new now whether i'm not saying that it's right but so that you board new board members do know this they do have there's a reason why they don't just come here and fred can probably elaborate on it much more than i could well actually it's it's, it's more widespread than that now if we call the state and ask the question, they refer to the Attorney General's office for an opinion on whether or not they can answer the question and do what we'd like to have done. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes takes a month before they get an answer on something that may be, need to be done a week from now. So maybe you are correct in dealing with um, at, on a bigger level, like with Nancy Stiles or whoever, but there's something procedural that's done on a procedural level that reason why they will not come here. And that it's been that way. It's not this year. It's not last year. It's been many of almost all the years since I've been on the board. It's getting worse, not better. Mm -hmm. But so it's something that needs to be probably done from a higher level. Well, if they come down off their pulpit and, and come down, <laughs> at least listen to what we. Have. I don't. I, I, oh, I think they're listening. I bet you they watch me every if, meeting. It doesn't matter to me if if they can make the decision here, but right. at least we need to be able to feel that we're being heard. Right. And I don't think that's the case right now. I think you're being heard. The problem is you're being ignored. Oh, amazing. Selectman Woodell. I, I still think, I mean, I agree. They can't make the decision. Mm -hmm. They should talk. And we should use every influence we have to influence them. Mm -hmm. So if they want to ignore us, then we should use every influence that we have to say, no, we don't want to be ignored. Mm -hmm. We want to be listened to and, y you know, Mm -hmm. We're, we're contributing agree. to the economy in New Hampshire. Yeah. We're contributing to the uh, state. We need to be heard. We yep. need to be dealt with. I got one more under old business. Yes, sir. Town auction. Are we? Yes. Is there any plans? Or is I was going to try to hold the, the week of Fourth of July so that we could <laughs> <laughs> sometime to, in that period so that we could make sure that we had lots of folks attending. I'm still waiting for lists. Okay. I'm just and I and I have recently picked up a number of important additions to it from the police department. They have such an extensive list; they can bring it up in sections. Oh. So uh, some of the material, um, as we have done before, for instance, for the uh, the police department, uh, old clothing which they take and, and pick up that is turned into them. Mm -hmm. If it's not claimed, we're advising them to turn that over to, you know, Goodwill or one of the other agencies because yeah. that's not something you want to hold on right. to an auction. Right. Um, 
we have in some cases materials like uh, uh, cell phones. In the past, the board has authorized us to give those to the Wounded Warriors program. That means they're obviously all discharged and so forth. Some of them are, are just trash because they've been dropped in the water at some point in our time. Uh, in the case of money, when money is found and turned into the police department, their waste of statutory period of time is not claimed, and it becomes property of the town because nobody comes back to claim it. Um, we've actually been reviewing that to see whether or not, uh, I'll give you an example, last year or the last auction we held was a little over a year ago, uh, a nickel was turned in with a very early date, and we ended up collecting substantial money on them, twenty-five or thirty dollars on that one nickel. So we we try to review all that, maximize all that money, and and put the maximum money into the, into the general fund as as found income. Right. So we're, we're going through everything with a fine tooth comb. We will have a lot of bicycles. I can tell you that. Always do. Always do, and we're that we have a bumper crop this year. I understand. So. But we are working on it, and I, I want to hold it as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. Final comment on old business. Uh, we have an extraordinary rela relationship with the, the state of New Hampshire. It, uh, the state of New Hampshire is a $5 billion corporation at a minimum. We are a $50, $60 million corporation. We uh, share in, in work a boundary that is one of the finest beaches in the world. We have just dedicated extraordinary resources, as the state has, to improving that, to include the pump house we just did. And we should always seek self-improvement with that relationship. I think, and this is, these are just my feelings, that we identify issues and that now that there's an election coming up this fall, that these are the perfect questions to ask candidates that seek that high exalted seat that some of you here have, have served in, in Concord, whether it's the Senate mm -hmm. or as a representative, and, and to uh, influence the battle and influence the information and spread the good word about Hampton. Mm -hmm. And again, this is a, this is a, a, a geographic area, 03842, that c contributes $150 million plus to the state in terms of revenue through their revenue camps, if you will. And so uh, we've got a great relationship, but we're looking for an even better relationship. And I think that Selectman Waddell is exactly right in that when, we, when you deal with the, the institutional employees and, and the lawyers, that that becomes problematic. But I think in your elected representatives, that's the way to go on this. Absolutely. And I know there's there's comments here under new business, Roman 12. Selectman Wolsey, right back to you. Just, just harking back a little bit to what Selectman Griffin had to say. No wonder there's dysfunction, for God's sakes, in Washington, because they learned it here. And this is, this is outrageous that we can't have a small bit of respect from state employees, of all things, not just, not just elected officials. I have two final. Uh, Sergeant Newcomb just retired from the police department. I would really like to see a letter from this board go to the sergeant. Done. Mr. Welch? Yeah. I mean, he served, you know, honor, and he was part of an incredible class graduating from Winnicott, 1983 Winnicott class. A lot of nice guys came out of that. And the CIP meeting, which I am going to continue lobbying for. I think we need to clear the tables and sit down and understand what we are proposing because this has been boilerplate as far as I can see. I've been watching the CIP for a number of years. I sat in with the committee a couple of times. They're not very happy to see me. But uh, I am tired of the um, boilerplate that's going through to the CIP. I would like to see us sit down, clear the table, start from scratch, devote an entire meeting f to start the discussion and sit down and try to figure out where we're going. Jay Dean was right on the ball. We have not really been planning, serious planning for the future. We're planning from year to year. We're living from day to day. There are major projects that need to be done in this town. There are major considerations that we have to take. And frankly, I don't give a flying banana about a $75,000 truck. I mean, I do when we're talking about rolling stock. But in the great scheme of things, I think it's up to us to present a plan to the voters and residents in this community that's going to give them a glimpse of what's going to be happening probably in the next 20 years. I'm thinking of roads. I'm thinking of infrastructure. I'm thinking of sewer, sewer, sewer and public works. 
we are going to have to plan or else we'll pass on into history as a bunch of seat warmers and I don't want to go that way. I do not want to go there. So I'm asking for a special meeting, chairman's selection, uh, whatever spare Monday night. Uh, if we're not all running around the beach, I don't run around the beach on Monday nights. If we can spare a Monday night in our little hiatus here for the summer, we need to do this before we set up the budget. I think we need to have this in place before we start sitting down in August, uh, late August or September. The years fly <coughs> by, and you know, you know this, and I can tell you from long experience that I know this, you get elected in March and you have no clue where the year goes. The year is gone before you know it and you're sitting there planning the budget and the warrant articles and, and there's, there is absolutely no time to waste. I would really like to see us sit down, clear the decks and one whole evening as a starter because there's a lot I think we need to discuss and think about and I'll be getting a list ready if that will help you out. Thank you, ma'am. And I want to come back to that as the chair that I serve uh, you, you for. Um, any other new business? Okay, thank you. I, I think that uh, the appropriate way to staff a, a CIP is for Mr. Welch to shepherd his department heads, and it comes from the experts. Police chief, public works, fire. They're the ones that know their profession. Mr. Welch has got 50 years in the business, so he needs time to sit down with his folks rather than from the top down, because the top down uh, doesn't work. And these folks have a, a, a good feel with their vested years in the business. They have a, a real feel for the taxpayers and what the taxpayers' threshold of pain is for this going forward. And they have a real feel for operationally in, in terms of personnel, what they need to conduct their mission. And so I think Mr. Welch needs to get with his department heads, have that bottom up. And I don't think that the summer is the time when we are perhaps at our operational highest to be tasking them. And perfectly happy to meet more than once a week on this or ha have a couple of meetings uh, post Labor Day, let, let them stand down for a bit and gear up and, and, and roll up our sleeves. But I, again, for me to be telling uh, Jamie Sullivan and for me to be telling Chief Silver and me to be telling uh, Public Works, Keith Noyes, what's going on. Um, uh, that's not appropriate for Mr. Welch. And so I would, I would like to commit to that if you all agree that Fred exercises that and we roll up our sleeves after Labor Day, give the, give the uh, departments a, a chance to, to rest up um, because they work like crazy. And then we, we go at it in the fall. And, and I'll back to you and then I want to go yeah. for the rest of the new business. But we're I asking I, the department. It, I thought it was my turn to talk. We, I just want to, we'll come back to Mary Louise because she raised right. the issue and then we'll go to the board, okay. please. Yes, ma'am. We're asking, I sit here asking department heads to tell us what they truly need when they're planning for their annual budget, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I've done that every year. They're going to be focused on planning for the 2015 budget this fall. But I think, and, and perhaps in conjunction with that, if uh, Mr. Welch sees fit. We need to have them think ahead 10 years minimum, probably. We're talking about bond issues. We're talking about big things that have to be done in this town. And I'm going to hark back to 1986 when the planning board and the budget, when the board of selectmen and the budget committee got together for that first sewer bond. The deal was supposed to be $7.8 million to construct sewers, which we desperately need. I'm not even talking about constructing new sewers, reconstructing. And the public passed it. Everybody was enthusiastic. We, we did the sewer construction for that bond. And in 1991, when the second bond was planned, that Board of Selectmen never put that article on the warrant. That never went on the warrant. There's got to be some kind of ongoing commitment out of this board and the boards that succeed us to literally plan for the upkeep of this town or we're going to keep going to hell in a handbasket. Okay, I think, I think okay, you've so. made that clear, sir. I think it's inappropriate for, we have two new members of this board 
that haven't even talked these things over with the uh, people that are hired to do all this work, all the department heads that are well paid and do a wonderful job, how can two new, new members of this board make any decisions on what should go on the CIP when they haven't even discussed these issues with the department heads? I think it's wrong and I think we need to uh, make sure that these new board members get to find out what are the facts and what needs to be done here. I just can't imagine how we can start putting things on the CIP when they have not even met with the department heads. Thank you, except sir. Except on a limited basis. Thank you, sir. Selickman, Bridal. Well, I, I think I know most of our departments pretty well in this town, uh, having worked here for a number of years. Uh, but I also think that a fall is a better time. Okay. I think we have. Um, it is a busy season, not just for one department in particular, but all three departments. But it is something that we have to look at them for their recommendations of what they need. They're the ones that need to tell us, you know. Um, my my profession was in the fire department, but fire department's changed since I left there. And so what they need is different from what they needed when I was there. And so I think it's up to our department heads. Um, Public Works, the police chief, the fire chief, to come up with their plan. But we need to do that early in, in September, right after the Seafood Festival and, and before we get into the budget time. So I, I think that's Thank the best you. Thank you. Second Rodell. Well, we currently have a CIP, right? Correct. Yes. The report I saw. Mm -hmm. So there currently is planning that has but been taking place. It may not be exactly what you want or stuff, but I agree with, with Rick, I agree with Phil, and I, and I think department, in Rusty, I think department heads are the people that develop it. I think they're the experts. I think they're the mm -hmm. ones working through Fred who let us know. And, and I agree that top down doesn't, you know, work. And, but, but I think you, you utilize all of your expertise that you have in town to come up with it and come up with it properly. And then we make sure that it follows through and goes. So, yes, that's my feeling. Thank you very much. Uh, and seeing no new business. Uh, closing comments, Roman 13. I would just like to say that, you know, what happens here at the Board of Selectmen is, um, I know that Rusty knows all about Hampton, but you see a different side of it when you're Selectmen than what you see when you're working in one of the departments or a lot of, you see a real different view of it. And that's what we're here and that's why we get to make these decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further closing comments? Seeing none, a motion to adjourn? Uh, I'll make that motion. I'll second it. 2106. All those in favor? <laughs> Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh-oh. Thank you.